Ready. Play. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, whatever time it is in the world, wherever you are tuning in from. Uh, we are here uh, to go through some of the matches of the year. And I have placed this unilaterally at number four on the matches of the year. But having just revisited it, I almost can't believe I didn't put it any higher. Um, I knew there was a reason that this match between Daniel Eitmar and Yannick Sinner stuck in my head so much throughout the year. But actually, I've just revisited it now. I know <laughs> maybe it could have been number three, but um, we'll talk about that maybe uh, as we go through this episode. Of course, um, tell us about tell us something about Daniel Eitmar, Altmar that you think a lot of our audience won't know, Damien, before we get into the match itself. Wow, <laughs> I mean, that's kind of hard, actually. Um, let's just say, oh, yeah, let's do that, because this is very relevant. He has a 3-2 and two win loss record against the top 10. Okay. Which, that's actually, cool. by the time he played Sinner at Ron Garros, it was 1-1. One, one. Of course, okay. uh, when he beat Sinner, it was 2-1. and one. Then he was even 3-1 and one after he beat Rublev and it, in Hamburg. And then he actually lost to Holger Rune in Paris very recently in Bercy. And of course, Paris, Bercy. So yeah, he is still three and two against the top 10, which is absolutely sick uh, for, you know, a player who I guess hasn't been ranked in like the top 40 or thereabouts. And also um, I think on hard courts, his first top 50 win was actually against Fields in that very same event in Bercy. So yeah, um, yeah it's, it's a pretty ridiculous statistical quirk. I, I believe that if we get Daniel Altmaier more sample size against the top 10, it's probably going to like, you know, even out and get into more predictable um, territory. But um, yeah, I mean, we, we cannot really take it for granted. Right? Still, it's, it's ridiculous to win uh, three of the first four top 10 matches you play, uh, especially for a player who is not like, you know, in the top 10 themselves. When I threw this in as a possible match of the year, um, did you think to yourself, yeah, this is a definite top seven? Uh, or Because we mentioned Yannick Stricker against City Pass and a couple of others. Um, I was pretty keen for it. I could have been voted down and, and, and kicked out the building for it, but I was pretty keen for it for a myriad of reasons, and they have just been confirmed to me as I, as I, as I revisited the match. Um, I think it definitely cannot make the top three, by the way. Uh, that, that, that would be a big stretch in my opinion. But um, I do remember that I had this idea in mind where I want to have at least one of these sort of low-key-ish, because it's still yeah. not low-key. I mean, you have Yannick Sinner, one of the four best players of the year, uh, perhaps the second best or maybe even the best player of the last two months of the season. Mm -hmm. So it's still not actually that low-key. But I, I do, did want to have like at least one of this included. And Tsitsipas Striker, which you just mentioned, that was definitely one of them. I think we also were considering something else that was like around that same ballpark. Um, I can't remember what it was. Yeah, the there was another one. That maybe, I mean, there was Byers against Feast, I think, was sort of being Monfils. discussed. Yeah, Monfils, sorry. 
yeah um no I, I, that that wasn't on my list really but um yeah i think Steven admire is a fine top seven selection for sure and uh maybe the best out of all of these yeah five set classics that we got at the slums this year well, not taking into consideration the Wimbledon final, which isn't quite as dramatic, actually. You know, it's just no. has sort of more major importance and uh, meaning in terms of, you know, long term careers and et cetera. But like still, Sinner Altmaier, I think it deserves to be up there. And I'm, I'm glad it is. Uh, personally, I didn't really care if it was going to be this one or Tsitsipas Trigger. The. Um... The, one of the things, the, one of the characteristics to the entire match that I like is that we see both players, as we can do on clay, but I, not always, we see both players in so many different parts of the court, hitting so many different shots, whether it be one-handers down the line from Altmaier, whether it be zipping forehands from Sinner, whether it be good smashes under pressure, bad smashes under pressure, rallies that continue despite the numbers of uh, smashes in them, moon balls as well, although probably more from Altmaier than, than Sinner. Um, and it had all the drama. And I, I think I'm guessing the reason why you would say that a top three would be a stretch is, is you probably don't rank the quality as high as some of those other players. And by the way, I agree that Sinner now is kind of a class but at this point on this surface in this part of the season he was kind of a you know a guy that you sort of think you know you could easily miss his match and he goes out you know a sort of a felix a taylor fritz sort of esque sort of player at that point I mean, i'm a bit of a sinner on clay hater but i think you're sort of taking it to an even higher level right now like he's still really good on clay you know he's made run Garros quarters in the past yeah. uh was it the greatest season for him not really uh, in terms of of course the spring uh in, in terms of the clay season not as a whole uh, but that was also because, mostly because of the health issues, you know. And um, he still had that Monte Carlo semi run. He dominates Rune for a set and a half. I, I, I think he was absolutely like, you know, among the top, let's say, eight contenders to win it. It was still a pretty big upset. And I think, especially considering, you know, the entire 2023 campaign of Sinner, even at Grand Slams, because we keep saying that he hasn't actually proven. It's at the Grand Slam stage yet, well, more so in best of five play. But if you look at all the other campaigns that he had this year at the slams, I mean, he loses to Tsitsipas in Australia, five sets, of course. He loses to Djokovic at Wimbledon, straight, but, you know, it's Djokovic at Wimbledon. And also at the US Open, of course, he's, a, I mean, just a, maybe, maybe a little tired at the fifth, but still loses to Zverev, who at the US Open and in Cincy, had the best, um, yeah, that's just the best patch of his season, 100%. So, um, I mean, he loses to absolutely elite opponents and Daniel Altmaier, which sort of, um, uh, in hindsight, I think just adds to the mystique, to the, to the story of this match. And um, yeah, I mean, it, it would be very easy to just put it down to, you know, Sinner, best of five struggles. And I think in a way, in, um, in May, in June, we were probably doing that for the most part, like we were just, yeah, Sinner is not actually a huge contender for this title. He can absolutely lose to Altmaier. I mean, he did go five with Altmaier at the US Open in, in 2022 as well. And of course, these courts, you know, you would expect to suit Sinner a lot more than and Altmaier. Well, as I said, I mean, his first top 50 win against a, against anyone on hard courts was um, actually just last month. But uh, still, uh, I think um, if we just look at the whole 2023 and Sinner's slam campaigns, it is very clear that the Altmaier match is actually an outlier. And even if we look at uh, Sinner's, you know, last few Ron Garros campaigns, the Altmaier match is also an outlier, which again just adds to... Uh, the um, meaning, you know, the narrative of this match and um, that it was actually quite monumental for Altmaier to get this one done. And especially in... Uh, oh, actually, and then before I said that uh, Sinner made Rangar's quarters, right? it was the f fourth round, right? But you oh, know, maybe it was against Rafa. It felt... It felt yeah, like yeah. That, that's the one I was thinking about, but I think it was... Um, who was it that Rafa played? Like? Well, never mind. Uh, you know, it's not the most important thing. But yeah, I, I thought about I thought about that much against Rafa, but it was the forefront of the quarters. But anyway, uh, what I'm trying to say that is this is that you know compared to his previous Paris records, this is an outlier compared to his um, 
actual slam records in 2023 as well so especially to get this done in five hours and 26 minutes and i'm a big sucker for for five set clashes i totally get the argument as well that well most people probably didn't watch it from start to finish i don't think i did either i think i started watching it more so somewhere along the time when it got interesting which was probably mm -hmm. like the fourth set really uh, but um, yeah, there's just some real magic about these matches going on for so long and it just adds to the drama, you know, in a way that the best of free format for me cannot really provide. There was a feeling for me, and by the way, yeah, um, Sinner did get to the quarterfinal in 2020, and he played him in the, he played him in back to back for uh, French Opens 2020 quarterfinal. Oh, so it was a quarterfinal. Okay, quarterfinal. thank yeah. you. Yeah, but the sort of the, the cold one when he really pushed Rafa was 2020. He might have even won a set in 2021, but that one didn't feel so close. But anyway, um, we'll worry about that some other day. Um, there was a feeling for me throughout, though, that Sinner was going to win this match. Um, and, I, and I think I was never quite convinced that Altmaier would win it. And I wasn't quite convinced that Altmaier was convinced that he was going to win it, despite <laughs> the positions he put himself in. And Yannick ends up taking the first set, right? Yeah. 7-6 uh, uh, on the tie break. Um, when we get into the second set, though, we do have another super, super tie break. Uh, sorry, super, super tight set. And we end up getting uh, another tie break as well. But this time it goes the way of the German. And from, from memory as well. Um, Even 9-7, I think. I mean, he, he had like five set points before he managed to clinch it. So, yeah, just two breaks of serve in the first set. 3-4 uh, and then 4-all, an immediate break back. And then the first set tiebreak, by the way, Sinner wins it to love. So he doesn't drop a point uh, in that tiebreak. Uh, seven, yeah, seven zero. And then we go into the second set. I'm um, just looking at the first set stats there. And then into the second set, uh, there were no breaks of serve before Altmaier wins it nine seven on the tiebreak. But it was a, I, I was watching the highlights just now, and it, it was a pretty epic end to that uh, second set. And then you're thinking, okay. This is actually a match that maybe I should tune into uh, if you hadn't done so already. And and if your memory does elude you exactly when it might have been, but it may well have been around this point. Because I think it, I, I don't think I watched it from start to finish, but I was certainly flicking between it. And from a fairly early on point, I stuck with it. And I'm going to completely guess that it would have been around the end of the second set. Um, but there were some epic points. There were some epic touches at the net. It felt as though this was going to be a tight one. I'm just watching the, the, the tie break, 9-7 point. Yannick messes up with a poor drop shot and ends up being, uh, the set was sealed with by Altmaier, who keeps his emotions in check as he does so with a smash. But then Sinner runs away with the third set, and it does feel as though it's that narrative of, of big fish, little fish. Little fish had his moment. Uh, but Big Fish is now going to run away with it. And Yannick's forehand uh, uh, seemed to be firing in the third set. Um, did you have faith in, in Altmaier's ability to sort of stay with Yannick? Um, I mean, the third set was a complete blowout. <laughs> uh, and it's pretty weird that we got a set like this in a match that lasted um, five hours and 26 minutes. But, you know, that only kind of tells you that all the others were very competitive and all the others actually had a number of extended points and even extended games as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, hard to say. Um, of course, by the time we get to the fourth set, Altmaier is like sort of a few times he's in front. So like he's still hanging in there. Of course, then Sinner serves for the match and there's some more craziness coming. But um, yeah. yeah, I think it would be very easy after the first set to just write off Altmaier because that was the moment when it seemed like, I mean, Sinner is just hitting through the court so easily that... There's no real hassle that Altmaier can employ and, you know, grind him down or, yeah, try to uh, find these backhand down the line openings or try to moonball him <laughs> to death, which, you know, right. in different parts of the match, these two things were probably the ones that were working Definitely. in his favor, like, constantly. The depth, though, that he was getting on some of his forehand, uh, sorry, his backhand winners down the line was was pretty impressive. This is Altmaier I'm referring to, the single-hander, of course. Um, I do recall, although the highlights don't show it, I do recall there being some Sinner physical issues 
not to the point that I thought he was going to retire, but it was like, okay, because once Altmaier does start to suggest this is going to go five, um, which he did at the beginning of the fourth set as he races into a three-love lead, I, I, I was a, it was some point during this fourth set I was like, oh, okay, this could be the key to the match. If Altmaier is going to win this, it might be because of attrition, um, which is something that we've dwelt on before with Yannick. It'll be something that we'll be keeping an eye on next year. I think Holger Rune sort of falls into that category as well. He's just one of these players that we're thinking, can they win a Grand Slam? Because can they win five setters on a sometimes regular basis, which unless you're Djokovic uh, or, or Nadal at, at Paris, you're probably going to have to win a few five setters uh, to win a Grand Slam. Um, and we've seen it with Yannick, maybe in New York against Carlos, but particularly in New York against um, uh, Zverev this year as well. And we've seen it a few times with him where he does come on the wrong side of, of five setters. I mean, I don't think it was physical issues, but of course he lost a five setter to Pass in Australia as well at the beginning of the year. But Yannick breaks back in that fourth set and does get it on serve until uh, a pretty crucial game at... Um, for all, I think it is. Uh, by the way, there's a, there's a, there's actually another game as well. I think uh, at three four. So uh, at three four. So this is Sinner serving, uh, I think. And uh, I'm just going to count the amount of juices right now. But I think there was one, uh, two, three, four, five, six, seven juices in a particular game at um, uh, at four three. Sorry for for Altmaier. And Altmaier does end up holding with a very sumptuous volley at the net. Um, Sinner then holds as well for four all. And you're thinking, and he held, okay, it wasn't comfortable, but 40-30. And then we go into what probably feels like the most important game of the match, but actually in, historically will now be seen as one of the least important. But um, And that's because Yannick breaks serve at four all. So he breaks Altmaier's serve. It's another fairly epic-ish game. It has a couple of juices anyway. And so now he's serving for the match uh, at 5-4. And this is when things got, if it wasn't interesting already, this is when things got really, really interesting. Any any thoughts on the on the, on the the match, on the game, sorry, when Yannick was serving for it? Um, two match points. I, I honestly don't remember one of them. It wasn't in any highlights that I could find. Um, obviously, the second one is pretty famous with... Uh, Net cord that helps admire. I think. I think he was probably well. I'm you know, Sinner, I'm Sinner was that. in the point. Sinner was in the point. Let's say that. And if the pass just made it over the net without clipping it, Altmaier still is probably the favorite to win the point. But of course, it might get really tricky. Sometimes you're at the net and you're just gonna, you know, put your racket neck to the to the ball, and you know the, the touch suddenly becomes like um, one where it barely bounces after the, you know over the net. So um, you know you never know. But anyway, of course, the net court is pretty famous there, and uh, it does help Altmaier quite a lot. Uh, he uh, manages, of course, to take it to the fifth set as well, thanks to that one game where, you know, to his credit, I guess he, he did defend very well, but there was certainly some, well, uh, tension from Sinner you wouldn't really expect him to feel yet in this spot, I suppose, because, I mean, he's trying to serve out a fourth, fourth set, set against Daniel yeah. Altmaier, 5-4, uh, second round of Ron Garros, right? So that yeah. that tentative smash, of course, that leads to the net court is is probably the the moment to regret rather than the net court itself. It would be wrong to to focus on that, but more so on the sinner smash down the middle, which uh, yeah just leaves it all open for Altmaier to try to look for a pass. Yeah, I've got that frozen right now. That smash. Uh, so he's it's so again when we say this. So for those of the uh, people who haven't watched the match or even recall this exact point when we say that sinner has a smash at uh at match point for him you know on three uh, three of the four slams he almost certainly wins the point of course there is a fortune that it actually happens at Roland Garros on the clay uh so that gives Altmaier a chance but 
Sinner gives him an even bigger chance because he decides to go down the middle with it. Therefore, probably keeping himself in charge of the point, um, but not winning it outright. I would suggest that's a sort of highly likely outcome. But what he does is actually, because he lets it bounce and he's quite close to the net, he actually goes for a very, not only is he going down the middle, I don't think he even gets that close to the service line with the smash. So, or maybe it does hit maybe the service line. But that then means that that I'm now watching another frozen shot where Altmaier has got two cho choices with this forehand. He either goes for the riskier, but it's very doable forehand pass, um, or he goes for a sort of lofted one again. But I think maybe the pace from, from Yannick, despite it uh, landing on the service line, um, probably means it's probably going to be slightly easier actually for Altmaier to go for the passing shot, which he does. I agree with you that actually if it doesn't clip the net, Yannick gets his racket on it, but he either does a sumptuous volley and wins the point, but it's a 9 out of 10 volley, as in 9 out of 10 quality, not likelihood. Uh, or he gets the volley slightly wrong, which is more likely, and yeah, Altmaier has got a really good ch chance of uh, chasing that ball down. So the net cord, though, decides it. It means we don't have that conundrum because <laughs> it clips the net and just flips over Yannick's uh, racket. It wasn't a heavy net cord, and that was actually also quite advantageous for Altmaier because it meant it just zipped over. And we were back at juice, and eventually Altmaier breaks, and we go into a tie break, I think, at this set. He, he, um, he does hold his hands up in apology, but I think he's extremely, of course, happy with that. We get to five all. Um and yeah, as I say, we then get into a tie break. I think um, some more lovely backhands here and, and some net net approach as well um, in this five all game. And the crowd, by the way, now are getting into it. By the way, it's not Philip Shatry either. I think it wasn't Susan Longland either. Oh, it was Susan Longland. Yes. Um, Looks like Susan Longland from the yeah, highlights. Yeah, it is. Philip uh, Sinner played the first match on Philip Shatry. That was the famous night session between him and Alexander Miller. Everyone was so excited to see that one, and it lasted like 80 minutes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, that's right. There was a lot of controversy about the choice of that match, and, and rightly so. Uh, Altmaier does win this tie break with a, with a, a sumptuous, I'm going to use that word again, volley, which he's obviously very pleased about. And now we go into a fifth set, uh, backhands firing again. Just to give you some indication, though, of what the highlight reel of eight minutes and 42 seconds, I don't know if that's the highlights that you've seen, uh, as yeah, well, the Eurosport one, right? Yeah, exactly. because Ron Garros was a lot shorter. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So the I, mean, I, I tried to look for both because, well, apparently neither has the two match points, right? For for Sinner, so not both match points. There's one, the one that the, the yeah. net cord one is shown, but not the other one. No, um, yeah. but unfortunately, of the, uh, I don't remember the other one. But um, <laughs> yeah. So, but to give you an indication that the video has basically not even reached halfway, and they are three two, I think, in the fifth. Um, to give you an indication on on how important they value the fifth, which of course is the decisive uh, element of the match. But there was so much, of course, that went on before it. And there's a lovely backhand winner down the line. I'm just watching there from from Altmaier, which is kind of his trademark. And uh, he certainly showed it here. He then He then gets a break up though, Altmaier. So we've had a we've had that flip scenario where Altmaier must have gone on a pretty good run of games because he was a breakdown and, and Sinner was serving for it. And now he's a break up at 5-3 in the decider. And it's like, can he get over the line having seen what happened to Sinner? Um, but he couldn't. Yeah, I mean, there was that um, first time of asking. <laughs> to try to you know his attempt to serve it out and like every single shot of Altmaier in that game lands uh, like maybe half a meter after be, uh, you know behind the net <laughs> like it, it's literally no depth it's whatsoever awesome. and yeah. it just allows Sinner to crack the forehand again uh, well, there was a point in this match where Altmaier was just playing his normal tennis and Sinner was just violently hitting forehands and approaching the net anyway. It's not like, generally speaking, he needs it. Uh, but in this particular case, like, you know, it's very clear that suddenly Altmaier just cannot hit a shot that's, you know, let's say behind the service line. 
and um, that's deeper than the service line. And um, yeah, I mean, it's good for him that he managed to correct it. But as yeah. we said on the you know on the second attempt, not that it was an easy game. I mean, there were still a lot of extended rallies and lots of moonballing. Also, maybe some shots that could have been slightly deeper, slightly more aggressive as well. Uh, but as a whole, I mean, he played more of his usual stuff, took his openings in the in, on the second attempt. Whereas on the first one, I mean, it's pretty clear that he just, you know, loses it a little bit under pressure and is just allowing Sinner to have what he wants, uh, which, you know, it could happen, obviously. Uh, for Altmaier, this is like the biggest match of his career, really. Uh, he had beaten Bertini before. That's the other top 10 win at Ron Garros okay. as well. But that was like straight sets and, you know, it, it never got that dramatic. Um, so I think this one actually felt bigger for him. The the he, third one that he has also was like really lopsided, right? Against Rublev, where Rublev was pretty tired after Bostad. So so that's the one where it like was really dramatic for him. And obviously, you know, we cannot really judge him for showing that. He gets to I think 15 all um on his serve. Um so he, I think he wins the first point actually 15 love. But there's a lovely drop shot from from this is at the 5-4 game by the way uh, when he's trying to serve out for the first time there is a lovely drop shot from Yannick um and then actually he wins i think three points in a row and he gets himself two break points at 15-40 however he isn't able to capitalize on that and we do get back to juice um uh, i'm just watching some of these points that you were suggesting were, were pretty short but he does get back to juice and we do see another th 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 we, th we did see some pretty meaty points in this match no Absolutely. I mean, lots of rallies where um, basically Sinner is, of course, controlling the point for the most part. Then Altmaier comes back into the point with a moon ball or, I don't know, just some other good defense shot, a good defensive resource. And then Sinner is maybe controlling the point again. Then he doesn't like fully clinch it. And then you actually have Altmaier, you know, maybe seeking something. Maybe there's that back and down the line opening again. Maybe there's actually a chance for him to you know grind it down and then um for him to emerge on top yeah i mean there, there were definitely a lot of rallies that you know had shifting momentum and uh well the the aggressor was not always the same player from start to finish i feel like that's something the highlights actually don't really show okay uh, well maybe maybe on a few occasions right but there are a lot of rallies in the in these highlights where Sinner just sort of cracks a big forehand, goes to the net, and plays a great volley, right? But I feel like a lot of that match was also him still, at that time, struggling with that transition game, with wrapping up the points. Of course, that's also presented in the highlights with the smashes and, you know, a couple of points that um, Altmaier wins like that, where Sinner just can't quite find the finishing touch. Uh, but I feel like a lot more of that whole battle was also about this, that Sinner was at the time still struggling to convert advantages positions. The juice point, um, I mean, you, you probably have to go through the whole match with a pen and paper, but the juice point, uh, so he's he saved two break points to get it now at 5-4 deuce. Uh, as Altmaier's, again, we we know what happens and he doesn't quite do it. But the the juice point is one of the most epic of the match. It's not not the closest to the longest. It's probably maybe 10 shots uh, just off the top of my head. But the reason it's so epic is because Altmaier is on the defense, as you mentioned. He's hit a couple of short balls. Yannick is basically punishing him, turning up the heat. He hits a wonderful forehand down the line that Altmaier can just get his racket on. And now, because of Altmaier's positioning and he's out of the court, actually, even a probably... This is an easier smash just because of Altmaier's position than the one we mentioned before on match point for Yannick. Uh, and so Yannick should just put this one away. However, and we were debating what happened, and we'll let the audience decide, I'm 90% sure that Yannick's smash hits the tape uh, on the net and therefore drops short. I know that you have the belief that um, it's I mean, a miss hit. W with this replay, I mean, there's no way of telling, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, but I anyway, just, we'll, let, we'll let the audience the decide.
but there's a there's a there's a hand up from Yannick. Uh, Altmaier can't believe his misfortune because basically he's about to earn a third match point uh, because uh, Yannick has messed up the smash. Uh, and in fact, maybe Altmaier, despite his core position, may well have actually got some kind of defensive shot on this one if it had been a clean smash. Um, but he doesn't get that chance because it hits the net. Uh, the commentator says it hits the tape uh, anyway, and it drops short. And um, Sinner apologizes, but now he's got a break point, uh, which he ends up converting. And so Altmaier on the verge of his biggest win of his career. Right? I mean, I know you mentioned some of his top, top moments, but the biggest win of his career, right? It, w it was and would have been, right? Um, debatable with Berrettini, but uh, I think uh, if we just factor in the fact, you know, that the one against the Berrettini drama. was so straightforward and here we have yeah. the drama, then yes. Right now, like if we look at it in hindsight, this is definitely bigger. At the time, you know, if it was a straight set victory over Sinner, actually arguable, which one? Sure. But because it was so dramatic, because he had already saved match points, because Sinner had already saved for the match, yeah. I mean, at that point, I think it was pretty clear that he is playing for the biggest win of his life. I think the one against uh, Berrettini might have been around further as well, but yeah. eh, I don't think it matters all that much. Not not second or third round, yeah. And the, the break point when Sinner converts is kind of a point that we do see a few times in the match where he is kind of on top and... And uh, Altmaier is just defending, and it ends actually with a smash that um, this time Yannick puts away cleanly. So, of course, momentum and tennis, we know, uh, such a huge thing, especially when you were the pre-match favourite, as Yannick was. Uh, I would imagine that uh, I don't understand all the betting prices, but probably I would have, my odds would have been something like 75, 25 Yannick. Maybe I'm being a bit generous. They were, I mean, you're you're pretty generous, I think, in Altmaier's favor. Actually. Oh, really? Okay, so you'd have gone yeah. eighty twenty or something, would you? I mean, I'm, I I just know what the odds were, and um, I don't think they were particularly wrong as well. It's best of five, you know. This this is a big factor as well, that it's True. best of five, and um, yeah, it was like eight to one or something like that on Altmaier, which I guess in percentages would probably be like what twelve point five. Yeah. That's my... Um okay, so twelve point five percent, is that what it's saying? Um, you know, I'd have to look at like a calculator because well, I'm only familiar with the decimal, which I guess decimal should translate to percentage. Yeah, it does. So basically twelve point five per twelve yeah, yeah. Twelve point five percent for Altmaier, more or less. There's there's um and this might be a bit easier percentage wise for you to work out because um there's a love 15 point. So it's now five all and Sinner is serving. Uh, it's love 15, which I always think, you know, if we try and take away the surface, but perhaps on, on clay, uh, maybe it means a bit more. Uh, you lose the first point and it probably gets a bit closer to 50-50. But the crucial one is if you then go to love 30 and then you're sort of like, then it's like, I don't know, 50, 60% chance of breaking if it's player A against player B. I think Some... it's lower than 50% that you're going to hold, yeah. Really? I, okay. I think yeah. so. At, at love 30, yeah. yeah. So, and um, the other thing about this love 15 that becomes love 30 point is it's just an unbelievable backhand from Altmaier. He... takes it on the rise. He's quite close to the baseline. It's none of that um, namby-pamby uh, short ball stuff. He decides to go for it at this point. Maybe he feels liberated having had the pressure of trying to serve it out and he just hits it low over the net and it, you know, it actually lands well before the baseline as he, sorry, well before the service line as some of those other shots are done, but this was an extremely high risk one because he took it on the rise and Yannick is left for dead and it does indeed mean an Altmaier break. But of course, the match could not be in the top four, in my opinion, uh, by just finishing that easily. Um, Altmaier does then get a match point at 40-30. Um, I think he went 30 love up and then got pegged back a little bit. But anyway, it gets to 40-30. And um, 
Yannick saves the match point. So now it's Yannick's turn to save a match point uh, in another fairly good rally, although actually it doesn't end with a winner because Altmaier just, just gets his racket on it, trying to defend, but doesn't succeed in that defence. Uh, then at Deuce, we've now got Altmaier trying to do a smash, and he's the one who's actually a bit cautious. But Yannick doesn't punish him because... Altmaier does an unbelievable touch at the net, a sort of stop volley. Is that is that the shot that, that you would call that when he's at the net? He just dinks yeah. it over. Stop yeah. or drop, yeah. However, we have another match point, and we've got the closest that Yannick might get to a kind of Djokovic, Alcaraz, maybe Nadal, but his celebrations tend to be a bit different. Esque, where when you win an epic point and you just freeze but you're freezing in pure joy and you just stare somewhere in the audience, maybe towards your team, maybe towards just a random point. And even though there's no smile or anything, he's obviously overjoyed because it's a smash from Altmaier and Sinner hits a clean passing winner to save another match point. Oh. Yannick, Altmaier at this point must be wondering what he's got to do win the match. Mind you, Yannick may have similar feelings too, which is why I rank it so highly that both of them, of course, had really good chances to win the match. Altmaier, of course, having a smash there and not putting it away, but um, an epic passing shot. He then gets a break point, but Altmaier's a bit more decisive on this one. And then he gets another break point. I'm actually just, of course, as you can probably tell, I'm watching the highlights again. So Sinner really now is really turning up the screw. And he comes into the net and he should win the point, but he's cautious. Yeah, I guess th there's a smash as well. There's a couple of smashes here from Yannick as he's trying. He should get the tie break, but he doesn't go for the smash on that one. And we're back at neutral. And then the moon balls return. Maybe uh, Altmaier's thinking, you know what? Moon balls isn't such a bad idea. And Sinner errs, and we have a sort of a semi racket smash. Do you remember that point? Um, semi racket smash, not really, but I guess I was. He throws his racket at the floor anyway, but he's, the there's, there's, not a, there's not a contact with the hand and racket, but he throws it at the floor. If the umpire doesn't give him some kind of warning for that, then I, uh, I'd be surprised. But he throws it at the floor because. He had three, four, five chances to win the point. But because of caution from Yannick on pretty much all of those chances, he then does an unforced error that really was very uncharacteristic, but may have been down to fatigue or because of the anxiety at the point and uh, puts it wide. Oh, uh, I mean... Really? That's an unforced error? That's not even an unforced error. But anyway... You don't, uh, you don't think this is an unforced error? Hang on a second. I'm just going to watch it again. Yeah, I mean, I so. first of all, he, first of all, he's a smash there. He should have done better with that. Then I mean, he has yeah, a chance to... He should have done this. better with, like, three previous shots. But, exactly. You know, this is this is an approach shot from Altmaier. He's going at the net. That's that's actually not going to be classified as an unforced error. But, you know, of course, he, he had a makeable pass. But, Very makeable. yeah, I, th I think the main story still is, is that yeah, he had a couple of, especially that one smash earlier, which he just hits in such a soft and like tentative way. Um, there's also a yeah. smash. He ba he bails out on a smash as well. He bails out. And also, out on there's um. Oh, I mean, yeah, that one of the it was baseline, difficult. But like, but like that that one you usually bail out on and and just play a normal ground stroke. But yeah, that allows Altmaier, of course, to really take back the initiative and and you know put some pressure on him but um also yeah if he takes one of these break points we get the 10 point tie break right which at least in theory should um you know be be better for the let's say better player overall <laughs> and the player yeah. who's who's saved uh, most recently saved mm. his own bacon yeah um, i mean yeah the player who has the momentum of saving to i mean ba basically breaking twice when he had to Whereas yeah. uh, the other player would have been, well, struggling with the idea of losing his serve twice when trying to serve it out. Absolutely. Of course, Sinner yeah. had one game like that as well in the fourth set. But yeah, but the, it was the, sort of so long the ago. Recency, the recency mm -hmm. matters. Yes, I agree. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, who knows? Maybe Altmaier still wins the 10 point tie break. But he definitely. And maybe that elevates it to uh, number one in our list if he won it, like <laughs> 15 13. Yeah. Yeah, if it was like 30 28 in the third set tiebreak, probably. Yeah, yeah, uh, I think exactly. in the fifth set tiebreak, yeah, probably. Um, curiously enough, I said about the variety of points. Well, he won it with an ace, 
and then uh, the celebration I remember as vividly as any other memory from this year. So when we were talking about, you know, suggesting it might have been the biggest win of his career and you, you highlighted the Berrettini match, um, certainly in the moment anyway, because of the, the drama, uh, you know, his celebration suggested that this was the most incredible moment of his tennis career, at least anyway, and uh, bursting into tears or, or certainly tearing up anyway on, on the bench afterwards. Um, yeah. And I was, I was kind of a neutral observer throughout. I wanted to see an interesting grand slam and therefore I wanted to see some of the big cheeses go far. Uh, but, uh, I will, will never forget the way that Altmaier ended up celebrating that match and having won it, I was pretty pleased for him. Yeah, I'm not a very emotional person, so like that part of the match, you know, when the match ends, I maybe sometimes will see the handshake, but like that's where I'm leaving the court. I'm watching another match already, you know. So <laughs> can you remember what match you switch to next? No, no. I mean, I it's the remember. it's it's one of the first days of a slam. Absolutely. Yeah, no I just remember, I remember there being more or less what, what part alone. of the day it was, but I yeah, I remember the part of the day. It was like five, six o'clock, wasn't it? Probably started yeah. about three, maybe a bit earlier. Actually, might have been the second one on. Could have been one. earlier. Yeah, it could have been like yeah. two p.m. start or something like that. I mean, I'm pretty sure it was going on at like you know that the most important seven. parts were going on at like six, seven. Yeah, yeah. but anyway, uh, yeah, I, I have no clue what I would. Yeah, yeah, it's our our time zone. Um and um. Yeah, I, I have no clue what I switched to, uh, but yeah, the, this, these emotional things, you know, <laughs> they don't really get me. But certainly, uh, like when people try to argue that the best of five format sucks and we shouldn't, you know, keep it up in in at the Grand Slam stage or wherever, really. I mean, just look at this match. We have no thing to talk about if this is a best of three match. And, and I'm sorry, but that's just the reality. I mean, this match would never make anyone's top seven if it was just the best of three match. If it's best of three in order to get to that sort of level of, you know, being a classic, it's going to be really hard. I mean, it has to it has to be like really special and I don't know, stand out. Um, well, Djokovic Alcaraz, Djokovic Sinner, this yeah. year, you know, you've but got I think matches for... against like two huge names, right? And also exactly. maybe some huge drama in the Cincinnati third set as well. Um, let's say, like, I mean, from most recent years, for example, Orindernech, Karenio Busta last year in Gijón, I mean, had the 19-17 third set tiebreak. But so, like, it stands out in that way. Whereas here, you have, like, the more usual drama, you know, back and forth. But the thing, the, the, the way it was so long, the way it was five hours, 26 minutes, uh, such an epic, it really elevates it. And... Yeah, I just don't think this ever becomes the match that it was in the shorter format. So, Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, an example of that, rightly or wrongly, the PCB Rinderneck match didn't come close to my reckoning at this time last year for, for uh, matches of the year. Did you watch it, though? No. Yeah, yeah, I think if you did, if you did, it would have made your, well, I don't know okay. if top seven, but like your top 15 reckoning yeah i, th I think um, it would have. like it, it but, was definitely the best tie break of the year and i think it absolutely belonged in the other than manorino at uh, uh, nadal uh yeah i think so but i i knew you were gonna say that one actually <laughs> yeah um uh, that we'll have that debate another time probably not a on nadal a fan will always bring up that's true nadal yeah, that's true. in any conversation that's why i always bring up federer in any conversation yeah. I mean, yeah. the the five set though element you're right i mean i i just quickly noted down of course stricker and city pass buyers and and um monfils that we already touched on as well you know it's it's probably the three set matches as we'll see throughout this series both on the men's and the women's side the three set matches that do get included elsewhere are just unbelievably high quality involving players one, two, three, four in the world, if you like, uh, in semifinals yeah. or finals, etc., and therefore just couldn't be ignored. A three-set epic in Gijon, as you mentioned last year, is easily going to slip from the eight radar if you didn't watch it. In particular. I mean, that's not exactly how my, uh, you know, what my example was because I was mostly saying that that one didn't slip from people's radar. 
big raiders, I guess, because um, it had that insane tie break, 1917. Sure. But like that's something that's gonna happen in like one in a thousand, you know, scenario. Whereas most of the time, if it's just like a regular, oh, we were actually just talking about this on the on the space, right? About creating the shortlist where Jack mm -hmm. sort of suggests Hurkacz Kokinakis, for example, in Miami. And I'm like, yeah, but we have 50 matches like this this year. Uh, so I think that the reason why Rindernech Karenio Busta was a bit different is because it was 19 and 17 in the tie break. And it just had that one thing that really stood out from all the other dramatic battles because you don't really see you know especially deciding tie breaks like this whereas um yeah uh, many other matches like that one will actually um yeah just get forgotten and i think it's no real uh, coincidence that when we were creating that top seven list or whatever we i think for for the low key peaks it was always going to be uh, a slam match even when uh, some of the people tuned in, right? For example, I think Elena ex requested to speak and she brings up Fils Arnal, the US Open. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I think that the matches, as you said, the matches that have made the top seven, if it's a best of three set match, it's probably two huge names. Yeah. It's of course going to be very different on the WTA because there everything is best of three. Of course, Grand Slams you know, still carry um, sort of major Some meaning. Way. And, and I was way, kind of yeah. thinking that as well when I mentioned on the WTA side that it's that the non-slam matches are huge names, if you like, uh, or big yeah. names anyway. So I, I guess it works both ways. Yeah. But, but in it just diff, it's just different because of the you know no difference in formats. And, but and certainly different... it's it's much tougher for a best of three set match to stand out if it doesn't have yeah two huge names going at each other. Yeah, uh, and producing just their a game for large parts. Um, and for me, I think variety is a word that we've, we've used at, at times today, but possibly also yesterday when we were discussing this. And I think Altmaier Sinner stands out in this list of seven as being, um, yeah, unique. I think it's, 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 it's unique, uh, in the, in the list of seven. Um, it's different. And also in terms of like variety on the court and, you know, how yeah. many different shots and the repertoires that exactly. we saw in this one. It, it's pretty cool. Of course, that's something that Clay sort of gives you, but at the same time, Lens you also have, you have, need to have a player who can capitalize on that. And well, that's Daniel Altmaier. Sinner, to his credit, can also do it. Uh, well, increase. he's getting increasingly comfortable at it. And I think even in this run, Garros match, he probably already saw some of that. And uh, yeah, I think I said earlier that I um, didn't really care if it was going to be Tsitsipas Stricker or uh, Asiner Altmaier. Like Tsitsipas Stricker is definitely like more my brand of tennis, but I do understand, I, I, I definitely have to agree that it's like a way simpler match in terms of, well, the dynamics of it, the patterns of play, the um, tactics as well. I mean, Strika just goes at the Tsitsipas backhand, right? With the lefty uh, servant forehand. And uh, yeah, that's kind of it. I mean, you also have the exceptional shot making, which maybe, you know, you're going to get in a slightly... Uh, well, you're going to get slightly less of it in a Sinner Altmaier match, maybe. Although it's it's arguable. Was Tsitsipas serving for that time, match, though? Did Tsitsipas uh, serve? Yeah, 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 yeah. Actually, yeah, yeah. absolutely. In the fourth yeah. set. Uh, five three or something like that, and then so kind of similar in that respect as well. At least that that score. They are sort of similar, but like, uh, yeah, I think if we if we sort of add the variety aspect and like just um, the wide repertoire on display, I'm perfectly fine with this Sinner Altmaier match. If I was doing my top set, my own top seven, I think it's actually very likely that both would have been included. Okay, uh, Daniel Altmaier uh, beating Yannick Sinner is number four uh, on the list um, for matches of 2023. And yeah, variety, repertoire, excitement, drama, uh, all of which have been touched upon in this episode. Uh, make sure you hit the like button. Make sure you subscribe. And um, I'm just going to say at the end of this episode, um, thank you, Daniel Altmaier. Sinner, I'm sure we'll get much thanks and praise, but I'm... Um, uh, Sinner is still and, gonna come, probably, right? Yes, I mean, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, his 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 um his moments in this list are, are not yet done. And um yeah, 
so a big thanks to Daniel Altmaier for providing maybe my highlight of the year, maybe. But it, even though it's my number one moment of the year, him winning this match and the way he did it, uh, it's not number one in the list. Uh, that is still to come. So, uh, everybody, you know the drill. If you enjoyed this video, make sure you hit that like button. Don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell so you don't miss out on all things tennis.